My name is Janet Todd, and I'd like to introduce my new novel, which is called Don't You Know There's a War On? It's set in the Second World War and in the aftermath, which many regarded as a rather diminished time in England. My protagonist, Joan, is a war widow. And the book tells of her troubled, rather struggling relationship with her only daughter, Maud. Joan is angry, fierce, and energetically malevolent. She blames her temperament and her situation on events that occurred during the war and on the cultural changes that have followed it, changes that she thinks have made her a misfit and an outsider in her own country. In the late 1975, the months of the late 1975, and throughout the long, hot summer of 1976, she begins to write her life, taking various events of the past and weaving them into a narrative that is both her imaginings and her experiences. She lets out at last, through this writing, much that has been long, long repressed. The revelations engulf both Joan and her daughter, Maud. In this book, I aim to give a voice to the kind of woman who is, I think, rarely allowed much entry um, into culture, into literature. We often hear from the daughters of 1950s lower middle class mothers, but we very rarely, I think, hear the voice of the mother. So my aim was to hear that voice, to let Joan speak in her own words. I know that she is unlikable. Some might even think she's monstrous. But I hope that by the end of listening, reading about her story, that she will be understandable. I also aim to illuminate this period of cultural change from Joan's point of view, because it, these changes, these changes that occurred in England in the 1960s and 70s are as profound as I think anything in our history. The claustrophobic life of Joan and her daughter have of course nothing to do with the present moment, but they might just seem the odd resonance, I think, from two women locked in a house. I'd like to end by, by saying how grateful I am to Chawton House and the organizers of this festival for allowing me to introduce my book and to do readings from it. I love Chawton House. Um, I've visited it many, many times, given lectures there. I love its house, I love the gardens, and I'm devoted to the library. I only wish that this event could be live. Thank you. This is the first passage I'm going to read from my book. I'm afraid it's a mirror image, but this is the cover, a rather splendid one, I think. My War. War was women's as much as men's. Allocating and filing ration books and coupons wasn't the agitation of a fighter pilot, but it was war work, demanded by the nation. Fighter pilot, spitfire woman, and office menial might be blasted to smithereens in the air or on the earth. Welsh Muriel sat beside me in the Ministry of Food Office. We'd been both conscripted into the work. Pleasant on the bench, making quiet chat as she prepared special ration books for bombed out families and counted out points, whilst I separated buff from blue and checked for illegal duplicates. We enjoyed a smoke and a joke then. What was a sausage made of when there was no meat? Laughing ourselves silly at a car driving along with a great gas balloon in a wooden cradle on its roof. Any minute we expected it to rise from the road and flee to the stars. Once 
We watched a bomb whoosh out of the purple black night sky. We saw the bull ring in flames in the distance. Muriel was good company at the time. Why wouldn't she be? Young, cheery and shallow. She greeted any nasty gossip with, it takes all sorts. She hadn't read How Green Was My Valley. I thought everyone Welsh read that. Couldn't get away from Ebu Vale fast enough, even if only to the Midlands. Air jangled when bombs were falling and exploding. Dim lights reflected on walls as the food office shuddered. Blackouts trembled against windows. Dust and plaster fell on ration books. Our Rembrandt utility frocks and coiled up hair. And we, the food office girls, giggled excitedly, nervously too. I danced inside. It was smelly and crowded in the Anderson air raid shelter where we hurried and the siren sounded from the town hall. But the eager jostling bonhomie and crush of strangers clutching gas masks and family trinkets were exhilarating all the same. Above the whisperings, we could hear fighter planes revving, circling and shaking the earth. After work, I'd stumble home in fog or dark over sandbags and through bomb rubble to mother's house, hearing Italians singing way over in the internee camp. I catch in my lungs the thrill of searchlights and sudden fires. One would have to be dead not to feel alive. You didn't need a front seat at the Battle of Britain. Olive and Rachel shared food parcel, parcels from America and Northern Rhodesia. I brought in Canadian tea from Uncle Harry. Mother said it tasted like stinging nettles and spat it out into a serviette. We didn't share nylons. Those without them could stain their legs with onion skins, then draw a line with eyebrow pencil down their calves though bare legs made no swishing noise when crossed. We all did in summer, told to. Don't you know there's a war on? We did know, of course we did. We were independent and smart, young and nice looking, even if patched and mended. I remember the day I shared the Canadian tea because a bomb fell in a nearby field I went to see it with other girls from the food office, with Muriel and Olive and Rachel and Edna. Parts of dead cows lay up the sides of the shallow hole, a worn shoe in the dirt and some furred wood still smoking. On the edge, boys from the evacuated public school pointed enthusiastically. Boston, said Rachel, who was from Ladywood. My spirits accelerated. I wanted to be away to London where more than just cows exploded, where sugar flowed in gutters when the Tate and Lyle warehouse was struck. One could lick the pavements for bliss as the molten sugar hardened. Where a cathedral floated above the blitz in a magic sky. Where women in square shoulders were just as strong as men where rollicking transformations took place and boys with a teeny bit of gumption were heroes and pushy girls became ladies. So I learned later. How could I know then? I'd stay as long as I had to in the Midlands, saving up to take a course in something, Pitman, I suppose, to make me something more, then get away as soon as ever to London. I'd step out to hear Myra Hess play Mendelssohn in lunchtime concerts in the National Gallery. Auntie Gertie would have approved. Hold to independence, she'd said. Never work in an office. Ring out wild London bells. I was vague in details in my single pleated best skirt doing war work, but I yearned for a smart flat in Kensington or Chelsea, as fiercely as Hardy's Jude 
or his snarling Christminster. Or Cousin Clare for county doctors and trunk loads of admiration. Oh, to come from somewhere else, to be going to a place far away, somewhere where the air was crisp and the talk witty, brittle and elusive. Not even Solihull would do. You don't forgive a person for messing this up. You don't forgive your country for fooling you either. My sec second section comes from early July 1976, uh, about two thirds into the book. This is England in an English summer. We're accustomed to a fugitive milky sun, the sort that's furred round its edges, gliding mistily past a silhouetted pine. How to explain the unnatural seaside postcard blueness this suffocating blanket of sky. You need rain to make sunshine worthwhile. It's tedious otherwise. Grey skies are deeper and more vacant than blue. No planes cut across them. They display no human bric-a-brac. Like a menacingly patient army, sun patters against our windows. In the early morning, it forces a shaft of light onto the settee in the sitting room where Maud failed fully to close the curtains. We used to open them last thing at night, but habits change. On the wireless, a face, a voice exclaims, what a scorcher, ladies. Not refined, but like Patricia Hughes, she knows full well the sun is all it takes to collapse standards. But other announcers can't resist treating the medium as a chummy next door neighbor, sitting by the microphone tireless, tireless or bare legged, I dare say. Platoons of white ladybirds crawl across the kitchen counter. They carry our icing sugar on their backs. It stops them flying and will kill them. But before they die, what sweet bliss learning in that moment the closeness of pain and joy, profound knowledge for a tiny ladybird brain. They travel from uncleaned cupboards. Now I've stopped baking. I've grown careless. Old packets of sugar and flour are damp and leaky. I don't squash the ladybirds, not even through kitchen gloves. The bodies would cause more mess on their scuttling feet, sugar and guts combining into glue. South End Pier's gone up in smoke. Brighton next? Blackpool? Scarborough? All that protrudes from the ragged sides of weary England. People let themselves go slack and indolent in heat. How much easier to be fastidious where air bites you. A bite declares edges and keeps the carapace intact. Until the grave, when we silently spill over and out, that of course. Through the front window I see wives lounging on squat walls or in striped deck chairs on cement patches. Untidy straw hats on their heads tight pink tops stretched over lazy breasts, legs bare and peeling. They drink pop from plastic mugs and let transistors bang out rhythms so empty it's no wonder they must smoke and cackle against the din. Pet dogs pant saliva onto thick matted hair. Decked in the same violent clothes as the mothers, toddlers get sticky knickers from melting tarmac on the road. Far hotter in India, Uncle Harry would have said, had he lived to see the summer. Even if you think the air's boiled, left to evaporate, then diluted, so that breathing its thinness becomes arduous, even then, compared with the steaming tropic places he spoke about, time and time again, it's nothing but a little warmth blown from a single cosmic 
electric bar. Is India so special now that any Tom, Dick or Harry in uniform could have dropped his trousers in it during our war? As for me, I've not been in the tropics. And Uncle Harry is dead. Claire popped round to tell me long before we had a telephone. Radiated to death, apparently. The ultimate heat. Like Hiroshima, I said. Not quite. Funny idea burning a person to a crisp to get rid of a tumour. She looked coolly at me. Fair enough. But she didn't show much sympathy when father died, or mother for that matter. Not that I wanted it. Only Aunt Laura left and she in a nursing home. Poignant since she's been ill all our lives. Maybe nerves are more resilient than livers and hearts. You have a strange sense of humour, Joan, said Claire. Mother and you used to say I hadn't a funny bone in my body. Poor Uncle Harry, dead before we could visit the Cotswold Cottage, drink G&T with an Oxford-educated son-in-law at the George. What a waste. Truth be told, it was hotter here in England in 1955, but people made less fuss two decades back. Remember that year? The year Maud's bogeyman, Winston Churchill, resigned from government at 80, seeing at last through the haze of whiskey or brandy or whatever ancient rich men drink, that the post-war world was not at all his world, and that his antique verbal heroics were as out of date as W.E. Henley's unconquerable captains. That year, Maud took and passed the 11 plus with my help. That year, when there'd been a great freeze, not just a bit of wind over the fens. Yes, things were way more dramatic then. They hanged Ruth Ellis for shooting her lover, which he'd every right to do, more than right he was a beast. And Princess Margaret gave up her dashing Peter Townsend because she wanted to stay an HRH and keep her gluttonous life. 1955 was quite a year. Thank you. I hope you buy the book and I hope that you enjoy it or at least come to think that my central character has something going for her and is understandable, even if she is a dreadful person. Thank you.